even better to meet with God together. Um, if you haven't had a chance to register yet because the meeting just started, please stop by registration afterward. We will be open out there. We try to have registration open in between meetings so that our registration staff doesn't have to miss the meetings also. Um, you may have heard at registration, we didn't get a chance to do the offering sheet like we've done the last couple of years. So we're asking everyone to use the, um, the schedule as a prayer guide for the offering. And just pray and ask the Lord if, uh, first of all, that the, uh, the missionaries will get what they need, the projects will get what they need, but also what the Lord would have you to be a part of during this week uh, and during the offering specifically. Um, we will be taking the offering Sabbath evening because like we usually do here, the church will have the normal church offering Sabbath morning. That will not be the faith camp offering. Okay, also... In the morning, those of you that have been here before, you know that in the morning, the showers are out in the shower tent. Yay! We have uh, Brother Ray Driggs. He is our shower king. I don't know. That man, he amazes me every year. So we do not allow showers inside the building, even though there are a couple of showers inside the building, except in the case of someone who's handicapped and needs a handicapped shower. Because if we take showers inside the building, that means there's no warm water for anyone else. Because it doesn't matter how short it is, it's always taking too much water. So we have to use the five-gallon bags that he's got out there. Um, otherwise, I think we are just about ready to start here. So our speaker tonight is John. But before that, we'll be talking with Brother, Brother Tim Maddox from Cambodia. How many of you see, have seen Tim Maddox at Faith Camp before? online or in person. Some of you got to meet him in person. Some of you have been to Cambodia. Yeah, we have some that have been to Cambodia. So it's always a blessing to go there. And, you know, Tim and Wendy's faith is such an amazing thing. And I know they don't believe that because God keeps them humble. But to me, it's just such a testimony of what God will do year after year when we just say yes, when we continue to say yes. And to see their Butterfly Paradise in particular, but all of what the Lord has built there, it just amazes me. And Butterfly Paradise, when we walked through it, before it was done, we were there on the Mission Trek trip when we were filming Mission Trek. And just to stand there and see this giant thing that God was building out of nothing. And, I mean, literally nothing. He had no money to build it with. And God just, it's like Noah's Ark. It's like walking through Noah's Ark to me. So... There's several places that are like that, the F5 Challenge Center and some other places, um, just to see what God is doing. Um, but anyway, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll turn the time over to John and Tim. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together. We thank you that we have the promise in your word that your spirit will be with us. Where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of us, Father. And so we thank you and we praise you that you are here. Father, I ask that you will guide Tim and John in what they are to say this evening, and that you will speak and you will hide them behind yourself, that Jesus will be lifted up, that Christ in him crucified will be able to draw us all to him. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. I just almost said happy Sabbath. <laughs> happy faith camp. That's our new motto. We can say that all weekend. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Thank you for coming. This is a, a tremendous uh, thing we do every year. We had to drive three days, four days to get here. And um, we just are so blessed. We have some people that say we cannot do a year without faith camp. So we come and do faith camp, um, although I'm a little bit disappointed because we've been, this is our 14th year of doing faith camp in the Pacific Northwest. I was expecting Jesus to come before now, you know? How many faith camps does it take until the whole world is reached? Should be like two, <laughs> but evidently it takes more. And so um, it's, uh, it's a huge uh, undertaking, but it's worth it because, you know, God God, if, if, and this is our prayer for this faith camp, is that somebody that has never heard the name of Jesus Christ 
will hear the name because of what happens here this weekend. And so we're excited about that. And Christ, the math of heaven, the investment calculator of heaven is that if you live your entire life in, in, in absolute poverty and struggle and torment in, for the investment to win one soul to the kingdom, they see, they see that as a good investment. That's the value of a soul. And it's hard for us to understand that. But as we contemplate Christ's sacrifice, his great love, then the value of the soul becomes much more apparent. Uh, Mrs. White says, in comparison to the value of one soul, worlds sink into insignificance. And that's not the human way of reasoning. <laughs> the human way of reasoning, the world's way is, you know, use money to get, use people to get money or to get things. God's way is you use things to win people, to bring people into the kingdom. Uh, which means also that you are that valuable. I am that valuable to him. Uh, the love that Christ has is, wasn't just a one time on the cross thing. That's just, that cross is just a picture into his love that he carries, that he has all the time. And if he needed to go to the cross again for us, he'd be willing to do it because that principle is abiding in us. I'm really excited about what we got happening this weekend. We've got some amazing speakers. We, when we were planning faith, faith camp this year, we thought, are we gonna have enough speakers to do faith camp? And then now I'm, I was wishing that we added a couple extra days so everybody had a chance to share. But we have some amazing things happening this weekend. Uh, we can't even talk about or, or publish everything that's happening and who's going to be speaking and what's happening this weekend. But how many, how, many people, how many of you this evening sense that something's happening in the world? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> it's like that's the most obvious question I could think of, right? I mean, it's like we just see, you know, the passion, um, the anger, the division, and then the pestilences that are in the land. It's like something's changing, something's shifting. And so what's our response? What is our response? And that we're going to be looking at that this whole weekend. We're just going to be cruising through people's stories, people's testimonies, seeing what God's doing in their lives, which is the most inspiring thing that you can do, in my estimation. We're ha we have people here. How many have you, of you have met the Tenkanos? Besides you. Okay, you. Okay, you. Well, besides you guys. <laughs> Because they were at faith camp, I think 2015 and 2016 or 17. They're here this weekend all the way from, from uh, Indonesia. And uh, they're hoping they can get back home because right now uh, it's getting tough. It's getting really tough. But they do this. They are doing this one here. They came out for uh, faith camp East and then... Uh, Michigan Camp Meeting, and they're doing Faith Camp West, and then they're going to be doing ASI. And we got an interview with them uh, for, on 3ABN. So I'm very excited about that. What God is doing in their lives is just a huge testimony of his faithfulness. And they began, they learned about the gift of service, serving God from a faith camp in Jakarta that we had in 2011. Was anybody at that faith camp? Anybody here? No? <laughs> it's not that far. Um, <laughs> it's actually going to Indonesia is easier for me than going from here uh, to here from Tennessee because I don't have to drive. <laughs> you know, you just sit in an airplane. It's actually about, 20, about 22 hours, 23 hours, whereas coming here is like 32 hours of just driving. So anyway, um, has anybody been to Indonesia? Okay, we've got several people. That's awesome. You can see it's like 17,000 different islands. So it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around Indonesia. I, I had to go there to figure it out a little bit because it's part, like this island up here, this part is Malaysia, and this part is Indonesia. So it's, and this, this part, this half is Indonesia, and this half is uh, Papua New Guinea. So it's like this massive archipelago of islands, just a cluster of islands. And then if you follow this up here, this is the Philippines which is actually kind of the same cluster of islands, but they just chose to 
not share or something, I don't know. Anyway, and then Australia is just right down below it. So getting an idea of what that part of the world is, is like. That, the reason why we, we focus on that is because Indonesia has got, you know, here it is, it's got like about 1,200 languages that the Adventist church has not started work in. <laughs> yeah. So um, given the chance, given the, that we see, we see the world changing and things ramping up and intensifying, many people I've heard all my life say, well, that must mean that Jesus is coming soon. I heard my mom say that. When, when, when I was two months old, my parents took me to New Guinea. This was in uh, 1964. And they made these uh, reel-to-reel tapes, you know, sent them home to, m- to my grandma. And, uh, and I have those. So I was listening to them a few years ago. And in 1965, my mother made this amazing statement. She says, I don't think we have to plan for our return to America in 1969, because Jesus has got to come before then, because the world can't get much worse. (laughs) How many would like to go back to the good old 60s? (laughs) Says the the (laughs) 20-year-old. But the world has gotten worse, amen? I have a theory, okay? Matthew 24, 14, you all know this. What does it say? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world. And then, and then. So my theory is that the world will continue to get worse and worse and worse until the gospel is preached to all the world. So what we have going on in the world today will continue to get worse. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse until... The gospel is preached to the whole world. Now, a lot of us say, let's finish the work so that we can go home. But does that sound a little selfish to you? Let's finish the work so we can go home and get out of this mess. And what about all the people that don't have an opportunity to even learn about Jesus, even make that choice? What if we said, instead of let's finish the work so we can go home, what if we said, let's finish the work so they can go home? You know, it it wouldn't make sense if I lost my eternal salvation so that two other people could gain theirs. What's amazing is what Jesus says, if I lose my life for his sake in the Gospels, then what happens? I find my life. But if I focus on saving my life, Lord, take me out of this mess, let's go to heaven now, then what's going to happen? It's the spirit that's, that's out, of, out of accord with the spirit that is in heaven. And so the spirit of self-sacrificing love is the secret <laughs> of heaven's happiness. And so to take on that self-sacrificing love, we often think, oh, that is painful. That sounds painful, to be self-sacrificing love. That's that's the experience of heaven. Self-sacrificing love is the secret of heaven's happiness, of heaven's bliss. You know, why did Jesus come to the cross? For the joy set before him. He was in... He was in a perfect environment and he's looking all over his kingdom and he's like, where can I find more joy? And he looks at our little planet and says, oh, I think I can find it there in the cross. And he came and he lost his life. And of course, he didn't, he died on the cross, but he didn't set up home there. He didn't stay on the cross. He's no longer on the cross. And yes, we have crosses to bear. But Christ, that's not his plan for us to stay on the cross for the rest of eternity. The cross is for a purpose. It's an investment in something worth the investment. <laughs> oh man, I'm, pre- I'm sorry, I'm preaching. Let me, for, for those of you that haven't been to much faith camp, I'll just kind of go through this really fast. And you can come up and look at it later. But this is a map of the world. And more people live inside 
Asia than the entire rest of the world combined. So 8% of the world's population lives here, 8% lives here, 15% lives here, 12% lives in Europe, and 57% lives in Asia. Yeah, so there's a lot of people up there. <laughs> if you look at this, all these dots are people groups, and the red dots are the unreached people groups, which means they have less than 2% Christian of any denomination, Catholic, Evangelical, Protestant, all that kind of stuff. So that's that map. Down here, this is the Adventist work in just the Southern Asia Pacific Division, and it shows the places. Uh, this is divided by language, not by country. So this is by language. And so the green parts is where our Adventist church is established and growing. The red parts in which is where there is no known members at all. So as you can see, there's some work to be done. So how are we doing this work? How, how, how in, engaged are we as a, as, a, as a church? How engaged are we with the work of taking the gospel to the world? Well, one measure is how are we doing with funding the work? How, you know, uh, you know, are we putting our money where our mouth is? I did this graph. Actually, I have it up here. It's going to be easier to see. Um, from 1933 all the way to 2005, uh, you can see this is per capita, and it's adjusted for inflation. So there was a big economic boom in the 20th century, and tithe kind of followed that trend. Uh, the local church budget, it's hard to see because it's yellow, but the local church budget kind of follows that trend also. It goes up like this. Okay, so it kind of follows the trend of the tithe. Now, what about world missions? This is what's happened with world missions. And it's, uh, it, uh, it's kind of a wake-up call. It's kind of a wake-up call. This is the, this is the culture that, that we have inherited this has been happening over the last 50, 60, 70 years. And so we've inherited this culture where in the church we can say, we can abandon the very reason God has organized us and still say that God's okay with us. And yet there's always the, something missing. There's always, we're always looking for something more. We're not really satisfied. Uh, we're looking for, for a closer walk with Christ. And I believe that this is the key here is that, in fact, Mrs. White makes a statement. She says that the Holy Spirit will not be poured out in full latter rain power until the major portion of God's church knows what it means to enter into wholehearted service for Christ. In other words, until we're doing this, the Holy Spirit will not be poured out in latter rain power. So the key to receiving latter rain power is to engage in his work. Amen. <laughs> okay. Well, missionaries... All right, we found this, uh, somebody at the GC found this little newspaper clipping over on the left, and then I found the magazine over on the right, I put them together, but in, this, is, this clipping on the left is uh, from 1906, okay? Prin some of the principal religious bodies in the United Sta States, and it says, Gift to Missions. So down here, we have Seventh-day Adventists. At that time, the membership was 79,422, and we had sent 577 missionaries. It's pretty good, huh? In 2013, North America Division sent 235. So less than half this, the number of missionaries, and yet uh, at this time, at that time, I believe that our membership was around one million. So a membership went like this, and missionaries went like this. So there's a shift in the church today, in the attitudes. I wanna share quickly, and some of you have seen this, um, a different kind of, sorry? Yeah. There's a different kind of um, uh, attitude towards mission. Now this is not an Adventist young man, this is actually a Mormon young man, and he's receiving his call to mission work uh, at this point, so here, let's, I want you to listen to the reaction of the people that are around him. Okay, here we go. Rasmussen, you are hereby called to serve as a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
We are assigned to labor in the Peru Lima East. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's kind of a different take on, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like their favorite football team made a touchdown. <laughs> and one of the biggest challenges, and we warn our young student missionaries that are going on a mission, don't be surprised if your Seventh-day Adventist uh, colleagues and, and church members try to discourage you from going. So this is, this is, you know, this is what we kind of can expect, right? In this time when Satan is roaring, is, is going around like a roaring lion trying to figure out who he can devour because he knows his time is short. What is really cool, and I believe, is that the more Satan works and struggles, the more God works. And God's in charge. And God is going to bring this to pass. And so I want to connect with my friend Tim Maddox. We'll see if he can, if this is going to work. He is in uh, Cambodia right now. Hey, Tim. Let me put you over there. And I believe is that the more Satan works and struggles, the more... Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Awesome. How you doing? Good. What time is it over there? Uh, it's 9.30 in the morning. Okay. Is it warm? It's warm. Is it as warm as here? Uh, probably three times as warm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know how warm it is there. <laughs> it's like 91 degrees here. Oh, okay, it's about the same then. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, yeah, we had a hot, hot spell come through. So, so Tim, where are you? And, and uh, you don't look like you're in, a, in Cambodia. <laughs> well, yes, we are in Cambodia, in the city of Siem Reap. Uh -huh. And uh, at the moment, I'm sitting in our television studio, um, on a little set that we built, and uh, as soon as I'm done here, I'm heading out with a group of my students to continue the building of a house at our other school about 40, uh, about 25 miles away. So uh, we're busy. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, Tim, what would you like to share with us tonight? I'd like to share with you my, well, the walk of faith that God has led my family through. And uh, I know you only give me like 20 minutes, so it's going to be very much a summary version. But uh, uh, I hope that as we do that and we look at biblical verses along the way, that uh, all of us, including myself, will be inspired more to surrender our lives fully to serving Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sounds good. Shall I begin? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. <sir. laughs> okay. So it's great to be, uh, to be again here uh, with you in Faith Camp. And it's a number of years since I visited your church and enjoyed Faith Camp there. And the, the back is very familiar. Um, today, I, I just want to briefly pray before I talk because I want all the glory to go to God. Our Father, as uh, I have this privilege of sharing the walk that you've led my family on over the last 36 years, we pray that it will touch the lives of those that are listening and that you will inspire them as you have inspired us and that all of the glory will go to you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I think today I want to begin with where... Well, basically, I began, and that was growing up in Australia. My mother was Adventist. My father was not. I got to go to Adventist high schools and a state university. I became an Adventist when I was seven, and I guess I was a pretty typical Adventist. Um, 
I went to church on Sabbath, and I, as a kid, I tried to read my Bible and pray every day. Uh, but I grew up with a Western mindset that the normal thing in life is to get a good job, the kind of job you'd like, have a family, buy a house, and all those sorts of things, and then eventually retire with enough money in the bank to make life easy until I die. <laughs> and that sounded good to me. It's Everybody else was doing it, so why not? Um, and I set my goal on becoming a biologist and studying of becoming a research biologist. My wife, she set her heart on becoming a podiatrist and taking care of people's feet. Really exciting activity. And that was where we were headed. Uh, I forgot to mention, we got married really young. Um, I got married the day I turned 19, still at university. My wife was still at university as well. Uh, but that's a whole other story. So this was our picture of, of what it was to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Hmm. Go to church every Sabbath, pay our tithe, put in our offering, help out where we could around the local church, and be just a good Christian. But then once we got married, God started doing something in our lives. And we, for our evening worships together, we would read mission storybooks. Back then, this is 1984, 83, 84, there were no faith camps, unfortunately. <laughs> and John would be a bit grayer if there were. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have less hair. <laughs> um, so we began reading these mission storybooks, and we began to, to catch a vision of what was inspiring these people of all different denominations to go out to places that weren't friendly, to go out and to be willing to sacrifice their lives and the lives of their families out there in the mission field, to live in poverty, uh, to deal with diseases that back at home they would never see. And, and God began to speak to our hearts and eventually we both arrived at the same position and that was we needed to surrender our lives to doing the work that God had in mind for us rather than the work that we had in mind for ourselves. And so in 1984 we made a decision and that decision was to let God send us anywhere to do anything for any length of time. God uh, took us up on our offer and it's now, this is our 36th year of being missionaries. So you, you're 42? And we've 42? served in country 36. You're 42 years old now? 36. Uh, no, I'm 30, 57 now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still young. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but God was good enough to send us to Western Samoa for three years. There I was teaching science, and then to send us to Fiji for four years. For two years, I taught science. For two years, I was a volunteer running the school farm where we were working. And all this time, God is deepening our love for service in a foreign land. Mm. And he's training us. And yes, we are serving in the mission field, but we were there to be trained. A day arrived when it's like I heard God say to me two things. And that was one, you are to be a pastor. And two, you are to work for ADRA. Hmm. Now I trained at a state university as a biologist and a teacher. I was not trained to be a pastor. And yes, I had been the lay activities leader. Uh, well, actually, I was still the lay activities leader for our church uh, in Fiji when God spoke to me. But that didn't involve doing very much. It meant driving a truck and delivering people to different places to do outreach. <laughs> I wasn't doing the outreach myself. And, and so my response to God was, how can I be a pastor? 
I've been a volunteer for nearly two years. I have no money. I can't go back and train. I've got two small kids. But I left it in God's hands. But the second thing God asked me was, can you work, go and work for ADRA? And that I could see myself doing. And I had connections already. And so we applied to ADRA for work. And again, there were no conditions anywhere, doing anything, any length of time. And ADRA uh, got back to us and made it really difficult because they gave us two options. And the first one was go to Africa. The second option was to go to Cambodia. Now, logic kicks in. I'm a biologist. Africa has animals. Great place. Number two, I've got small children. The place we were being called to work had an Adventist hospital on the campus. Two very big pluses. Uh, I guess the third plus was I was working in Fiji, or we were working in Fiji, and the people are very dark-skinned there, so moving to Africa wasn't going to be a big change. They're dark-skinned as well. But the second option was not a logical option, was Cambodia. Cambodia was still coming out of a civil war. The infrastructure was destroyed. Hospitals basically non-functional. Um, mines, landmines all over the place. Everybody's got guns. Just not a safe place to go. And especially with two small kids. And so Wendy and I both put our hands up for Africa. But we asked God what was his choice. And he clearly showed us Cambodia. And so we had to uh, make a decision. Was it what we wanted or was it what God wanted for us? And I say for us because I can look back now after being here for 36, nearly 36 years and know that God sent us to Cambodia because he had a lot that he wanted to do in our lives. And Cambodia was the place where that could happen. So we chose Cambodia because God chose Cambodia. And some of our family were not happy at all. In fact, one of my brother-in-laws stopped talking to us because he said, how can you take my sister and my two nephews into such a dangerous place? But danger is in the eye of the beholder. And when God is your shield, then danger is not something to be feared. And so in 1990, uh, sorry, yeah, 1992, we moved to Cambodia. And uh, it was a pretty wild place. Some towns, when I drove into them, I felt like I'd just gone into a Western movie. And there are guns everywhere. And uh, yeah, so we arrived in Cambodia. My job was to help rice farmers improve their rice yields. Now, remember the Bible verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, it applied even when we worked for ADRA because I'd never grown rice before. And I'm here in a country where for generations they've grown rice and I'm supposed to help them do it better. <laughs> but praise be to God, we, uh, we achieved this goal. And uh, that was a, an exciting thing. But something more exciting happened. I arrived in Cambodia on a very, very hot day. It was probably about 104 degrees Celsius. My oldest son, who was uh, three and a half at the time, developed a very high fever on the first day of us being there. And uh, the second day of us being there, and this is in Phnom Penh, the capital, my ADRA boss said, you need to go to Siem Reap and get started on your job. And you shouldn't take your family because there's no good place for them to live. So I've just brought my wife, two children, to a totally foreign country. My oldest child is very sick, and I'm being asked to leave them. And my mind went back to those mission stories where children died in the mission field. But this is God's work, and it's in God's hands. So I left them in God's hands and went up to Siem Reap. And of course, my son got well. The story is all good. And a couple of months later, my family were able to join me in Siem Reap. Uh, but my second day in Siem Reap, sitting alone on the top of a house that had a concrete roof, with my Bible in hand, 
in prayer early in the morning. Behind me is a Buddhist, a Buddhist temple. There are monks chanting. Around me there is uh, smoke from people's cooking fires rising. And I feel like I've gone back at least 100 years in time. And then an ox cart was, came creaking down the road, pulled by two cows. And a miracle happened. God gave me the feeling that I was home. <laughs> now, this is a foreign country. People are not my people. But God just gave me this sense that this is your home. <laughs> and now for 36 years, it has been my home. In fact, this morning I got a text message from somebody who was talking about some missionaries that were leaving, and they said to me in the text me message, I hope you don't leave. And uh, I said I had no plans to leave until Jesus comes to take me. So Cambodia is home. God did a miracle for me to make a place that was totally foreign, a culture that was foreign, a language that was foreign, to make it mine. And I'm very thankful for that day. Well, as I uh, enjoyed my time with Adra, it very quickly became obvious that God had sent me to Cambodia to do more than teach people how to grow rice. <laughs> and as I looked around me, I saw a city of people, most of who had never heard the name of Jesus. And I'd like to read a Bible verse to you from Matthew chapter 9, or a couple of verses. This is Matthew 9.35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the, their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus saw the multitude and had compassion on them because they had no shepherd. And in the 1040 window where I live here in Cambodia, that is a picture of most of the people. Weary, scattered, without a shepherd, not knowing that they have a saviour. And Jesus moved on my heart that I was there brought to Siem Reap by God to reach out with his love to the people of that city and the countryside. And so, untrained, as an evangelist, as a pastor, we began to do as the Holy Spirit led us and share the gospel. And it wasn't long before my wife Wendy was able to start English classes for the local community, God had placed us at the last minute in a, uh, a perfect location in the town. We were right in the center of the town. We were on the main street to one of the high schools. And so every day we had hundreds of kids going by our property. And the other thing that God had done for us was those two little children that we might have been concerned about became our best evangelists. You see, those two little white children of ours with their white hair at the time playing outside with their mother became a major attraction. <laughs> and it was through them that barriers were broken down and these English classes began. And from the English classes came Sabbath meetings and from Sabbath meetings came baptisms. And so a year before God had told me I was to be a pastor. And I had asked, how can this be? And it happened simply because I responded to the call to share the gospel. Hmm. And I became pastor by default because there was no other. And I thank God for that experience and uh, that has led on to many experiences that time don't have, uh, doesn't allow us to tell now. But I want to take you now to the next step of my journey or my family's journey. In 1995, our project with ADRA is coming to an end. We had the option of going into a second project, 
and continuing the work that we were doing except helping farmers grow vegetables and fruits instead of rice. And this is something that I was good at because I had done it in our schools in both Samoa and Fiji. But God had another idea. And he spoke to me in me what was audible and he started laying out in my morning devotional time his plan for my family. And I want to just give you a quick summary of what that looked like. He said, I want you to take your family out into the Cambodian countryside. Now, I'm living in the city, if you could call it a city, a little town. Uh, but take your family out into the countryside, and I'll add a few things, where people are very poor, where there are cobras and other venomous snakes, where people have guns in their houses. I mean, not just little handguns. I mean, AK-47 rifles and M16s. And they have hand grenades and rocket-propelled grenades. Uh, God's saying, I want you to take your family out there to live, and I want you to live like them. <laughs> that means living a life of poverty. It says, I want you to train people to be Bible workers. Now, this is stretching the word pastor to pastor, pastor trainer. <laughs> and uh, I want you to take your life savings. And by this time, we had managed to save up some money, about $20,000. I want you to take that and invest that all in the ministry. And things get worse. I want you to trust me. I want you to have faith in my ability to provide. Remember Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. I want you to take me at my word and not to ask people for money. I want you to buy land and put it in the name of the church. So I went to my wife, Wendy, and said, this is what God's telling me. And she said, you're crazy. God didn't tell me that. Uh, living in Cambodia, she was enjoying living in the city. We lived in a pretty much like Western style house. It was Western style because we built it at the beginning of our project as a part of the project. We had a normal kitchen. Uh, we had refrigerator and electric stove and oven and we had a washing machine and we had air conditioners and all those things. And now I'm telling her we're going to go and live in a thatched house out in the countryside without electricity and your kitchen stove will be a little clay pot outside the house. And uh, she wasn't so sure about that, especially with our two little kids. But we had made a commitment and that was to go anywhere, do anything for any length of time for God. And so she took it to God and said, show me. This is your will, show me. And God did. And she came on board. And so December 31, 1995 was the last time I got a monthly paycheck. Since that time we have been dependent on the provision of God. And so that's 20, more than 25 years. And God has never failed to keep this promise that, we, that I mentioned earlier in Matthew 6.33, plus numerous other promises as we have claimed them. Yeah. So we moved. 1996, at this property, it's about 40 acres. Uh, when we bought it, it was uh, sort of, it was only about three miles out of town, but that's like super rural because the town was really small and uh, there were no roads out to the property. The roads that there were to the town were very rough. Um, people all around us would take their cows out carrying an AK-47 rifle. When it rained really hard, they tried to stop up the holes in the sky with bullets. Uh, this was the kind of place that we, we moved out into. And God was... Uh, shield our protector. So we came out here to start our church in the local community where there was no Christians, where the name of Christ I think had not been heard. 
and also to start this lay training program to train new Adventists in the country because the country only really opened up to Adventism in 1991-92 when just before we arrived and so we are being called by God here in 1996 to train those new Adventists to become Bible workers, church planters and the training didn't get our way until 1998 we had to put in infrastructure and I can tell you when you start building infrastructure $20,000 isn't very much. $10,000 went into the land. We had to build a, a fence that is about uh, one and a quarter miles around. Uh, we had to build a road to the property and we had to build houses. Even a house that we built for ourselves only cost about $320. Uh, still the money dwindled quickly. We got around on bicycles back then. Uh, we didn't have a motorbike or a car. Nobody else in the village had a car, so we didn't feel it was right to own a car uh, because God had called us to live like them. And God worked miracles. The training got underway in 1998. The first group of trainees was 22 in number. I sent them out to plant churches, and uh, I then became district leader because now I had ten churches that I was overseeing. <laughs> and uh, the training went on four months at a time, once or twice a year, until 2007. And we trained over 200 people to be Bible workers. And the mission began picking them up, sending to them to all parts of Cambodia to share the gospel. And we began to see the fruit of faithfulness to the calling of God. Mm -hmm. During that time, I met John. And we immediately uh, struck up a friendship. Our passions were the same. Yeah. And God continued to work in uh, not long after we came out to this land and we were living in our little thatched house. People started coming to my wife and asking her to help them medically. Now, she wasn't a doctor. Uh, she has since become a self-trained doctor and a self-trained midwife. But uh, she began doing what she could to help them, using natural remedies. She'd help them get to the hospital and get medical care. And it wasn't very long before God just blew that up into a week hospital, Bush Clinic. And we had our own little hospital and our own little clinic on site. And God was using this in an amazing way to break down barriers and rich people. Amazing. But that wasn't the end. God wanted us to have a school. And so we began a school. Our first teacher was a local girl from one of our local converts from our church plant. She had two years of education, but she could read and write in the Khmer language. And so we gave her a whiteboard and a marker pen and a veranda, and she gathered kids, the poorest of the poor, from the community. And... Uh, began teaching and that was a miracle in itself. She still works for me as a teacher and one of her first students uh, recently wrote to me and told me, she lives in Germany now with her husband, she wrote to me and told me that she is now a health worker trained in Germany and so that was of a little tiny school on a veranda with a teacher who was had two years of education. Don't underestimate the power of God mm. when you put your life and your assets into his hands. Mm. He can do amazing things. Amen. Well, as we ran this clinic, people can began to come to us uh, alone with HIV AIDS. They were dying. They came to die at our clinic. And so we would love them and minister to them until they died. And one of those ladies had four children and the youngest was a daughter, seven years old. And the day her mother died, she was there helping to take care of her mother. And I sat her down on my lap and said, uh, your mother is dead. And she buried her head in my chest and cried. And then after that, I asked her a tough question for a seven-year-old whose mother has just died. What do you want to do? And I gave her three options. And the third option was come and live with us. And she took that option. And so that seven-year-old girl became our daughter. 
today um, she's 29 years of age. She has two children, and she works for us together with her husband. But back then, yeah, this was a new start for us too because uh, she didn't speak any English, <laughs> and our Khmer was still growing. <laughs> but uh, she was a great blessing to have in our home. She taught us a lot. We taught, um, but God began to lay on us a burden for developing an orphanage because we saw a need for a special group of kids. There were a lot of people that, a lot of kids that needed help in Cambodia, but kids who were being orphaned because of HIV AIDS back in the late 90s were um, in a bad situation because of the stigma. Nobody wanted to take care of them in case they caught AIDS from them. And so we felt God impressing us to start an orphanage. And there's a whole story there I cannot tell you now because of lack of time, but 2003, that orphanage got started. We started it on a family basis. So we had a husband and wife that we trained in our lay training program, and uh, we had them take care of their own children, plus up to 16 more children. And God just began to bless, and it wasn't very long before we were caring for 196 children by faith. Wow. And you may have heard of George Mueller's story. He was at one stage caring for 2,000 children by faith. We only got to about a tenth of that but we saw God do the same kinds of miracles for us as the, he did for George Mueller back in his time. And so now we have a school which is going up in grades. We have an orphanage, and that works really well because the kids can go to the Adventist school, which is right next door to the orphanage. And uh, we get boarding students coming from poor Adventist families who are converts from the church planters we sent out. And they need to be educated and housed and fed because their parents can't afford to pay. And so the monthly bills go up, but the stress goes down. Because as we walk in faith with God, we see him working miracle after miracle after miracle we stop worrying about it. We see that the same God that led the Israelites through the desert for 40 years, he can lead us too. The same way he provided for them, he can provide for us too. Amen. Well, I have to blame John for the next story because John managed to plant in our hearts a, a dream of having a multimedia ministry, television ministry, video ministry. And uh, that began way back in 2003, and it didn't come to fruition until 2010. But the dream was there, and putting the pieces of the jigsaw together so that the dream would become a reality happened in that elapsing time. And by 2010, we had a... $70,000 studio built, which when we started building, all we had was $200, and we just trusted God to provide. We had no idea what it was going to cost until it was finished. <laughs> and within a few months, we had $60,000 worth of equipment in it. And I must remind you, God told us not to ask anybody for money. And so we didn't. We just came to him, and we prayed. I remember sitting in this very room where I am now, there was a dirt floor with grass growing in it, there were walls, there was no roof, and I was praying, looking up at the stars at night, asking God uh, for the money to finish this building. And within three months of that night, the building was finished. And God had provided all the, all the money needed, and I never asked anybody except God. So we began to see these miracles not on a weekly or a monthly basis, but on a daily basis. Now, I think here's a good time to talk about manna months and Canaan months. We began to learn that God can bless us, and we call that a Canaan month. That means we have money in the bank for the month ahead. And then there are times when God will bless us, as he did to the people in Israel, as they were traveling, sorry, the Israelites, as they were traveling through the desert, he will bless us on a daily basis. That means we start the day with maybe enough money for that day. Not always. 
but every day was like the day out there in the Sinai Desert. God would provide enough. And we learned to walk by faith. This is faith camp. We learned to walk by faith that God, if God asked us to do something, the resources to make that happen, he had already set aside. All we had to do was walk in faith and those resources would become available. He would touch the hearts of people. And so that has been our journey. And so God is taking us in steps from little leaps in faith to bigger leaps in faith. And building this television studio was a big leap in faith because like, we're going to invest an unknown amount of money turned out to be 70,000 plus another 60,000 uh, in a project that we aren't skilled in doing, either the building or of or the actual running of. And uh, we're starting with $200 and we don't know where the money's coming from except we believe God will keep his promise. And, and, and God worked it out. But now God wants to take us one step further. Ah, just before I go on to the, the last story, um, I should tell you that when we started this television ministry, it was making videos in the Khmer language to reach out to the Khmer people. But satellite wasn't really an option because Khmer people didn't have satellite dishes. And television wasn't an option because the government controlled all the television stations and they weren't promoting Christianity. <laughs> so it had to be by DVDs and YouTube, etc. But just yesterday, uh, we launched our TV station. It's called Sankum TV, which is the translation of hope. So in fact, it's Hope TV, but it's Sankum in the Khmer language. And it's SankumTV.com. And so for the first time, we have streaming 24-7, the productions that we produced over the last 10 years, uh, out there, not just for Cambodians in Cambodia, but for Cambodians around the world. And the cost it, it cost us to actually set up this station and run it for a year was about $500. <laughs> so offerings have gone down for mission, but in some ways, the cost of mission has gone down also. <laughs> so whereas it used to cost $10,000, $12,000, $20,000 a month to broadcast the gospel through a satellite, now we can do it for $50 or less a month. And that's 24 hours streaming. Now all we have to do is get our, um, our website where people can look at that streaming, uh, advertise so people will find it and can learn about the gospel through that. So, in 2014, so this is four years after building the studio, uh, by the way, by this time we, we have a fairly large church, we have one of the six organized churches in, the Cambodia, in Cambodia without a pastor, so uh, we have elders that run it, but I'm sort of by default the pastor there, and we have um, a K-12 school with nearly 300 students, uh, we have a uh, orphanage, and back then we had about um, 150 kids in the orphanage. Uh, we now have a television studio, and it's like I have enough on my plate. Thank you, God. <laughs> you know, I, I'm busy. <laughs> I also had about uh, 60 people working for me, and so I'm busy just making sure my staff know what they're doing. But then God has this idea for me uh, that we should fulfill one of our long-time dreams, and that is to have an industry that will make money for helping our work. Um, and he brings a suggestion to me that we should build a butterfly garden for tourists. Now, Siem Reap is a tourist town. We have two... Before COVID, we had two to three million visitors a year, and uh, we are just a short distance from the town. Uh, there are lots of butterflies on the property where we live, and being a biologist, I like butterflies. They're a wonderful uh, example of metamorphosis, how the Christian life can change from being a life of sin to a life living in the perfection of Christ. 
And God says, I want you to build a butterfly garden. And I'd been to butterfly gardens, uh, being a biologist, and I had an idea of what a butterfly garden should look like based on what I'd seen around the world. And it wasn't some little cage. And John or Natalie already mentioned that, I think. And so I took a large white sheet of paper and I laid it on the kitchen bench and I said to God in the morning, I'd like to see your plan. And in the morning I got up and the paper was blank. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, God, you let me down. <laughs> I needed a plan. And he said, I gave you a brain, design it yourself. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't alone. I had the Holy Spirit to inspire me. But we, I drew up this plan for what this garden would look like. I hired builders and we began building it. We did budget. It was about 350000 I think, but quickly realized 400000 US dollars was more like it. And at the time, we are living manner months. We are living from day to day. And God is asking us to build a $400,000 project and then operate it. And I went to God and said, God, this time can we crowdsource <laughs> using the internet? The money's going to go to the orphanage. It'll help. It should be easy to crowdsource. And God's answer was, no, trust me. And so that's what we did. We, we continued this walk of faith, trusting God. And it took... From the inception of the idea in June 2014 to opening Butterfly Paradise uh, was December 2018. And God did an amazing miracle because the money just kept coming in. There were times when it would, we would come down to, I had two hours before I had to pay my building team. And they are poor. If I don't pay them, they go hungry. And it's like, God, I cannot let them go hungry. If you cannot provide the money to pay them in two hours' time, then I will have to stop the building project. And twice this happened. I was praying that prayer on Friday afternoon before I have to go and pay these people. And an hour later, knock on the door. Somebody walked in, handed me enough money or more than enough money to pay my staff that day, my builders. And so I saw that the same miracles that John, uh, that God worked for George Mueller, last minute miracles, he was working for us as well. And we went ahead in faith and finished that butterfly garden. But the faith walk doesn't finish there because Butterfly Paradise was built as an evangelistic center, an urban center of influence, as they call it. It was to make money, but to reach out to people with the first angel's message that, God is creator, but also he is judge. And, and so we've got it running, we've got it staffed, it's doing well. In COVID. And COVID means no tourists. And no tourists means no money. And so for the last year and a half, basically we have operated Butterfly Paradise at a loss. But we've never gone without. God has continued to fund it. So we have uh, staff that are still employed. We spend a lot of money on electricity to keep our fish ponds running and feed our animals and grow our butterflies and all of those things. And, and despite the fact that COVID happened, despite the fact that I haven't communicated with people for a year and a half about what we're doing, I've sort of had this media blackout, God has still kept us funded. And, uh, you know, this month is the first month in a year and a half where I thought we started the month with not enough money for the whole month. So for a year and a half during COVID, we've been living Canaan months. But uh, I checked my bank account in Australia the other day and discovered that on the 31st of July, uh, sorry, the 31st of the 30th of June, that's it, 30th of June, somebody put 10,000 Australian dollars in my account in Australia. And so we actually did have enough money for the whole month. So it's not a man a month, it's a Canaan month. So God continues to work those, those amazing miracles. So it's time for me to wind up. I've taken more time than I was supposed to. But I want to tell you that if you will go on your knees 
and tell God, I will go anywhere, do anything, for any length of time. Just send me. But you will begin to experience a journey that you never imagined was possible. And John, I think it was talking about the joy. The joy is just hard to explain. As each day you get to be in God's service, working together with God, helping Him to fulfill His plans and seeing Him provide. And that's what it's all about. I have one more text I want to share. And uh, I'm studying First John with my teachers and also my year 11 and 12 students at the moment. And this text is First John chapter 1, verse 4. And John is telling us why is he writing this epistle. And he says this, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And that's what it's all about. Not just that our joy should be full, but that their joy should be full. And so for me, it's about trying to help the Cambodian people experience the joy of God. Amen. Amen. And God does that through my faith walk, my family's faith walk. One last thing. I began the story of early my story about my two small children. Well, my youngest son turned 30 just a couple of days ago. And uh, he and his wife, Cambodian wife, they serve us with their adopted son that they have at home. And uh, my oldest son, he is 33. And he and his Cambodian wife serve with us as well. And so together with our Cambodian daughter and her husband, we all live next door to each other and we all work for God with the same goal in mind. And so mission life was a awesome way to grow up my children. And my youngest son, he will tell you, if he had grown up in Australia, he would not be in the church today. But today he is passionate about sharing the gospel. And uh, right now he's translating, uh, he's reviewing a translation of messages to young people. So he is fluent in the Khmer language as well as the English language. So please, Go on your knees and ask God, what would he have you do? Maybe he doesn't want you to go. Maybe he wants you to pray for missionaries. Matthew 10, Jesus, uh, sorry, Matthew 9, Jesus says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out more harvesters. Now you can only do that if you're willing to go and be one of those harvesters. But maybe God will not send you, but he will have you pray for people. He will have you help fund those that are out there. But make your life available. And if you're as blessed as I have been blessed by making that decision, then your joy will be full. May God bless you. you may say Faith Camp be heavily under the power of the Holy Spirit and everybody feel God moving in their hearts. Yes, amen. Tim, I'm going to turn the uh, computer around so you can see everybody. Um, so everybody can wave at you. God bless you all. <laughs> Have a good day, Tim. Thank you. Hi you Say too. Say hi to Wendy and Shannon and, Shannon yes. and Caleb and your Shreya and the whole family. Will do. <laughs> bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Um inspiring. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why we are doing the ministry that we're doing is, be is because of him. And it wasn't just the fact that God was actually paying his bills for him, but the fact that he had joy in that. I wanted that joy. And um, to see that God actually honors his, honors his, uh, his word. It's like we can see it in the Bible times, and we believe he's going to do it in the future, but will he do it now? <laughs> and will he do it for me? Yeah, amen. So I'm um, going to shift gears a little bit. I want to kind of start introducing a... God's been putting together different pieces of the puzzle of how we can launch into certain parts of the world that have been 
difficult. Okay, let's take, for instance, a country of Thailand. Anybody heard of Thailand? <laughs> okay, this is um, Joshua Project. Dot net. You can go and look at it. I, I, got, I took a screenshot this afternoon. You can see the progress level of the gospel. This is a uh, non-denominational, it's more evangelical. You can see that it is far over in the red. Uh, that means that it is not doing well as far as the gospel going to that country. Uh, percent of Christian adherent that's Christianity of you know, Catholic, Evangelical, Adventist, everything. 1.3%. Okay. So what does that look like? Um, you can go to many country, many towns, many cities, many villages, and, and many provinces, entire states, and not have any Adventists at all. Um, the... Religion is Buddhist. I don't know how, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to share what is all on my heart to, this evening. We're running out of time, so I'm going to do my best, okay? Um, it's hard to see it here, but those are spirit houses, okay? And um, every house in Thailand pretty much has a spirit house. And on the spirit house, every day they'll go out and they'll put an offering, like a soda, soda, soda pop bottle with a straw in it or some food or something, they will offer it and they will pray and that will keep the evil spirits at bay. So they believe in the evil spirits. Uh, why do they believe? Because the evil spirits will bother them if they don't do that kind of offering. Uh, snakes, uh, bad accidents, something bad will happen like that. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was planned. No, anyway, um, and they will do that. Uh, now, what's interesting is, is um, I was going to, uh, I was told by one of the missionaries over there that Buddhism is a thin veneer over uh, spirit worship. And you guys were there for two years? Two and a half years. And um, I went to, I was going to rent a, a building, and the, rent, the rental manager was there, and they had some spirit houses on the side of the property. So I says, if we rent this, can these be moved off? And he says, no. I says, but we're Christian. And he says, Christianity, Buddhism, has nothing to do with that. That stays. I've also interviewed, well, one of my friends interviewed a, a, a police officer and several other people that say that Christianity, all religions are good because they teach the people to be good people, okay? And so what, what we see, what, I'm, what I learned from that is that religion had to do with your behavior, but this had to do with the spirit world, and it was separate. So Buddhism is not, Buddhism actually believes that if there is a God, then he's too big to know. He's like a big stone sitting up there. You can't interact with him. So Buddhism is kind of an atheistic kind of religion. So all the spirit worship is actually folk worship. It's actually, pre, you know, before Buddha. So Buddha is this religion, this layer of religion put on top of what they really believe, how they really believe the world works. Um, so that was like a big light coming on in my mind. Let me ask you, let me ask. I'm going to use this. <laughs> it's one way to keep me. Okay. Do you believe in spirits? Yes. yes. Do you believe in a supreme spirit? Yes. <laughs> so do you think that we can reach them in that realm? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But now here's the biggest challenge that we've had in Thailand. And I think that this is a lot of Buddhist countries probably similar. And probably some other religious countries. Is that we come in and we actually try to sell a religion. We try to convert them to our religion. Okay. We in the Western world, we don't really, I mean it's hard for Westerners to believe in the spirits. You know, we're very scientific. 
And that all, we, very few of us actually ha encounter anybody that's actually manifesting and is de demon possessed and writhing on the ground. And has anybody seen that in Walmart lately? Not, not really. We don't see that around here. But it's real. And, and, and if, you, if you doubt it, we could just, I'll take you to India. We'll cruise around in the outback and you'll see it. I, I was asked to pray for somebody in a hut. Um, and I says, what's the problem? Well, he can't sleep at night. Well, what, what happens? Well, he wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's like this far off the ground, just hovering there. You mean there's nothing under him? No, nothing's under him. Well, what is it? It's an evil spirit. Can you pray to cast out the evil spirit? So he stopped doing that. And I'm like, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> you know? And you pray. And you come back, you know, you come back later, and, and, and he's fine. Amen. Amen. So... Um, Jesus in John 4 said, uh, the Father is a spirit, and he seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. So if the Father is the spirit, and we're trying to, our, our ultimate goal is to see people connect with Jesus, connect with the Father, and end up in heaven, right? So if he's the spirit, and he's the strongest spirit, and these people believe in spirits, then why not come in with spiritual uh, actions, Amen. spiritual, what's the word? Purposes. Spiritual. What? I just said spiritual, yeah, I don't want to use that term, but, but she says spiritual warfare. It's like you're doing it at the spiritual level. Your work, you're, you're, everything you're doing is at the spiritual level. Okay. So what would that look like? Um, well, I'm really excited to share with you that this is working, that we've tried it in two cities, and it's actually working. <laughs> yeah, big time praise the Lord. It is amazing. It's moving. It's, 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 actually, it's actually working in, in powerful ways. So, like, I don't know if I already said this, but the Adventist Church has been in Thailand for over 100 years. And nobody knows how to reach the Thai. Nobody's figured it out. Okay, even, even any religion, any evangelical Catholic, nobody has been able to touch the Thai, the heart of the Thai. I believe, and, and, and even uh, a very, uh, very well-read missiologist that was a friend of mine, I, in, I videotaped him at, um, at, for the um, I Want This City series. He says, nobody knows how to do it. They're just, uh, they just don't know how to do it. I think there's somebody that knows how to do it. <laughs> I think you know who I'm talking about. Jesus Christ. God knows how to reach the heart of the Thai. Okay. So, <clears throat> what if we ask him? Okay. And what if we put him in charge? of everything that we do. And our job then is to, is to follow him, follow his lead. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, okay, so there was a city in the north. Uh, okay, let me go to the map. I'm gonna quit out of here and go to Google Earth. No, I have it actually in here. Um, it's right here. Okay. So here is, um, here's Thailand, and right up here, Chiang Mai, and down here is Bangkok. So in 2001, I talked to a, 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 a Scott Griswold, and he said, and, and he was over there to do mission work, and he said, I'm going to launch, I'm going to do something in this valley. See this entire valley? It's the, bread, it's the rice basket of Thailand. It's kind of the rice basket of Southeast Asia. Um, this entire valley has only five million people, but it had no Adventists. Zero. In fact, in Thailand, there's about 7,000 church members in the country of 70 million people. About maybe 1,000 of them are actually Thai. So the rest are like minority tribes. Yeah, Koran and things like that. So all the, 
you know, Adventists are up around here and down here. Okay, up in the mountains. No, nobody down here. So he went ahead and he was, a, he was um, the leader of this Buddhist study center. And he went ahead and did a church plant here. Ayutthaya, right there. So now there is a church plant here. So you could drive from here all the way up. The next church plant was somewhere up in here. So you could drive for like eight hours without coming in a hundred miles of an Adventist church. And one time we were driving up there and they took us over to Sukhothai, which is the old capital of the old um, Lana, the Northern Thai kingdom. And they had these cool um, uh, uh, ruins of the temples and all that kind of stuff. And I learned that there was absolutely no Adventist in this city. And I'm like, wait a minute. That needs to change. Why? Why are there still no Adventists in that entire city? So I started praying, Lord, please send somebody. I kept praying and praying. And praying. That was 2012. In 2019, we did a prayer walk because I started learning more about the power of prayer and spiritual warfare. If you think about it, this place with no Christians for centuries, it was the playground of evil spirits. Okay, And I think it's in 2 Corinthians 4 where it says that the God of this world, Satan, blinds those that are going to be lost. He blinds the minds. He blinds the eyes so that they can't even see the gospel. And then, of course, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Even if it's sitting there looking at you with two eyes, you cannot recognize the kingdom of God. And it's like, this is the situation here. These people, even if I came in there, you know, I'm an Adventist, and they're, you know, even if Jesus walked the streets, they still would not recognize it because Satan is there blinding his eye, their eyes. And then I read in um, the Bible where Jesus says, Behold, I give you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the evil spirits, and they shall not hurt you. So it's like you put these two things together. It's like what if prayer started to change the spiritual things that we couldn't see, started to bind Satan from blinding people's eyes, and started to give God permission to send angels and the Holy Spirits into places that we couldn't go? And what if he started touching the people that he knew were the right people to open their eyes so that they could see, hey, here, this, this person has something that I want. Could that work? <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> we did that prayer walk, and within a few months, we found somebody in Virginia. We went up, Natalie and I went up and did two programs on Sabbath, maybe three, and there's this one family and I, they looked just like a really nice family. I'm like, hey, have you ever thought about going overseas? And they're like, yeah. Yeah, I think we want to do that. Where do you think we should go? I'm like, Sukhothai? <laughs> and so they went. Now, they took about a year, sold all their house, sold everything, and they moved over there. And the plan, we weren't sure how this was going to work. Because if you believe in a God that's all-powerful and strong... You can go anywhere, and with him, it's going to feel like home, okay? So normally what you do is you church plant a little hop, and then you church plant a little hop, and then, you know, maybe you don't really go to a place that's uninterred, unless you have some kind of big program or a lot of money or something that you could do, like a ministry that you could do. And, um, and so we're thinking, what if they just went there and their primary purpose was to host the Holy Spirit? It's like a beachhead, okay? It's like putting a beachhead. When, 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 you, when you guys, when any one of us goes anywhere, according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit lives within us, Right? So we become a beachhead for the Holy Spirit as we enter into those places. And then as you enter into those places, then the Holy Spirit can, then can send angels out and, and the Holy Spirit can start working and doing a work that we can't see.
And so they went there. They went there. The idea was they would go to Chiang Mai and learn the language, learn Thai for six months. And then they would go down to Sukhothai once they were a little bit better at getting around. And that's not God's, that was not God's plan. Because when they got there, they started to do poorly. Their son ended up in the hospital. They just did not thrive. And so they says, okay, they, Jonathan Hill um, and, and Hannah said, let's go down and we'll just look at the city that you're planning to go to. They went down there that very day. They rented a house. God led them to the perfect house. And they rented it. And they moved there within a month of landing in Thailand. And you're like, what's amazing is that brother, Pastor uh, Wesley Samko shared this idea the previous year in January. He says, you know what? I'm, I have a sneaking suspicion that if we go into a place that we're going to minister to without all our preparation, we come in weak. Okay? And then the people around you have an opportunity to help you. And you start developing connections. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't know where to buy food. So the neighbors were like, hey, I'll take you. And they take you to, took them to the, to the market and, and talk to the seller and this person, you know, help this person. So it formed this connection, this bond. And um, the way that the Lord led, I was just, their best friend now is a Buddhist monk <laughs> who recently got into a field that had just been sprayed with a very deadly uh, pesticide. And he took, and he asked his, his vet friend, he says, vet friends, oh, he's, they're going to be dead in two hours or two days. What did I say? Oh, yeah, no, he didn't go grazing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the buffalo went grazing. He had two buffalo, which he considers like his babies. And he was distraught. Oh, man. And so um, they're like, well, we'll pray for your buffalo. And he says, yes, yes, please pray. This is a Buddhist monk. And, and Robbie says, well, you know, it's got the devil strings around its neck. We need to take those off. Charms, sorry, charms. And, uh, the, and, and the Buddhist monk's like, yes, do. Oh, so he started taking them off. He said, oh, just cut them. And so this story's not done. This story is not over. But the the buffalo are still alive. Sorry, that story is over. <laughs> yeah, anyway, well, a lot of details there. I don't have time for a lot of details tonight. But this is what God is doing. They, and, and it's growing and it's moving and it's, uh, it's powerful. It's powerful. We don't know what's going to happen. And we haven't perfected. This is a brand new concept. Is the primary purpose is to go and get, I mean, how, how do I say it? Stay connected with the Father. Get filled with, you know, a consciousness of his presence. And then hear what he has to say and love the people around you. That's your primary thing. They've, they've started a church plant. They've started an English school. They've got a children's home. I mean, all these things are all happening within the first year and a half of them being there. And they're happy. <laughs> They've got how many children now? 17, 17 children? Yeah. Uh, I think five of them are their own. Ah, uh, powerful. So, while we were praying for Nakon uh, Sukhothai, we discovered another city. And its name is Nakon Sawan. Nakon, Nakon Sawan. Something like that. <laughs> Can you repeat after me three times, really fast? No, I don't do that. <laughs> okay, so Chiang Mai is up here, okay? Uti is down here. Sukhothai is here in the northern part of that big rice basket. Okay, so right in the middle, we discovered another city. Uh, Sukhothai is rather small. It's only 35,000 people. Nakhon Sawan is more like 200,000 people. And we've been praying for Nakhon Sawan and praying for Nakhon Sawang. And so last March, was it, we did the prayer walk? Yeah. 
And Jonathan and Hannah, who are the JFA foreign correspondents, they go out and videotape the projects, the missionaries and Bible workers and everything, and they send them back so we can put it into our show that we air on 3ABN every weekend. Um, we said, can you, I, w I was planning to fly to Thailand and do the two-week quarantine and then go do a prayer walk in Nakhon Suwon because the burden for those lost souls just started to build on me. And that's a burden um, that, we sh that we tend to be afraid of, but we don't have to. So I said, I, you know, I want to fly there. But at the same time, Jonathan and Hannah were like, we feel that we should go to Nakhon Suwon and do a prayer walk. I'm like, hey, that's not fair. I wanted to do it. <laughs> but they went down there and they got some of our Filipino friends that are living in Thailand and then they got, then, then we started telling everybody and a whole bunch of people, we had like 50 people, they were walking around, on, yeah, on a Zoom call, walking around that city with 50 people all praying for Nakhon Sawan. And guess what happened? Jonathan and Hannah got convicted <laughs> that they should go there. And it took a while. It's hard during COVID and all that stuff. And then they moved there a few weeks ago. And I just got an email from, or a, a newsletter that they sent out to all their friends. Um, two days ago, they said, Jonathan said, well, you know, I was working in the garden and I had a lot of things to do. And normally we go in three days a week. They got it, they, they're renting a house. Uh, it's on one acre, I think, just about... 10 minutes, five minutes outside of town, the center of town. And they say they go in and they exercise, they run and walk that, that, that circle around the lake in the center of town and they pray for people as they go. And Jonathan says, I was getting kind of discouraged about praying. I say, what good is prayer really doing? And until he came across some kind of quote or something that said that when you pray, God works. And that angels go to work and cooperate with you. So this thought came into his mind, man, when I pray, that puts an angel to work. And he got excited. So he went, and, and then one, one day, so every time he goes, where he's driving, riding his motorbike, just walking, whatever, he sees somebody, he just prays. He says, I'm sending an angel to work. <laughs> and then... Um, this happened just a few, a couple days ago. He, they went out and they did, he was, you know, saying, uh, getting towards evening and, and, and things weren't going right. He was frustrated trying to get this job done at his, at his, at his house. By the way, the house has cost like $160 a month to rent. If anybody wants a beautiful, nice place to retire, go be a Christian where there are no other Christians. Yeah, a lot of people retire there just for the beauty of the place. But you could be the only Christian they have ever met. Okay, so he's like, I got to get this done. We don't have time to go in and do our prayer run. His wife says, why did we come here? He's like, oh, okay. So they, it went a little bit late. They got delayed. They did their prayer run, run, and he's praying for everybody. And then on the way home, they, I mean, not very far. They went a little ways, and, and they, they were on a motorbike, and they stopped at a store, and um, she went in to get some, some, some supplies. And another couple came up, or parked on this side, and she went in. And then Jonathan was like, he's a lot like me, he's kind of introverted. Is anybody here introverted? You don't have to answer that. And uh, he's like uh, thinking, I should talk to this person, but I don't feel like it right now. And uh, it's like, kept doing that, and the Lord kept prompting him, you should talk to him. He says, no, I don't feel like it. And, then, and the Lord says, you should talk to him. He says, well, if he moves his motorcycle to this side of my motorcycle, then I'll talk to him. He did. <laughs> <laughs> so he started talking to him, and this is the friendliest guy he's ever met in Thailand. And the guy wants to be friends with Jonathan more than Jonathan wanted to be friends with him. And he says, I've been praying that I could make a connection with the Thai people at a more upper socioeconomical level that we could bond at that level and stuff, and, and this is what God is doing. So that's what's happening. This is that, I mean, this kind of connection, this is stuff is happening in just a few weeks. A few months, God wants to do this. And so this picture's coming together. We've got the faith of, of Tim. This is how God can provide for anybody that wants to go, that God wants to go. I mean, you've got to have that conversation. <laughs> Make sure it's him calling and not just, I want to go. I, we've been through that before. I mean, I'm, not you, but me. Yeah, anyway. So, um, and then we've got 
then we've got the, the power of prayer. So the idea, and, and, and is, the idea is to put, is to go into the darkest places of the earth and be there as God's emissary, God's beachhead in those places. And it's working. I'm so excited. So, are there any other places in Thailand with no Christians? <laughs> so we prayed for Sukho Thai, and we've got a family. We've got Christians there. We've got a church plant. We prayed for, for um, Nakon Sawan. We've got a young couple. God's doing miracles already. So I was talking to my friend that lives in Bangkok. He's from South Africa. He was the... He was an amazing effects evangelist in South Africa, and he felt a burden for Thailand, so he went there. Um, I asked him, he's married to a Thai lady, I asked him, um, are there any places that don't have any, any Adventist work at all? And he said, yes. Um, over here, here's Bangkok, if you come all the way over here, it's a city called Kantaralak. Okay, it's an old Indian name. <laughs> no. Kantaralak. This city right here has no Adventists at all. That doesn't need to stay like that. As a matter of fact, this entire province, Sisaket, Zero Adventists. Doesn't need to stay like that. So what are we going to do? We're going to pray. Yeah. And I've got some friends there. We're going to get them to organize some kind of prayer walk. They're going to go up there and they're going to start walking. And claiming Joshua 1, 6, wherever you put the sole of your foot, that have I already given unto you. We're claiming that. God's not going to go back on his word. Is there as people up there that God knows? God has been with them from the womb and has chosen them to be in his kingdom. And they don't know it yet. They need to find out. Okay. So then, um, I says, is there any place in Bangkok? He says, yeah. Because in Bangkok, you know, there's 12 million people. Okay, and he pointed out this one place, Bang Kun Tian. Okay, this entire place. You can see these are all Christian churches, but this place, there's no Christian church at all. So we got to do a prayer walk, and we got to look to God to do what he wants to do in that place and be open to whatever he leads us. I don't know who he has planned to go there and witness for Christ, but he has somebody. And he's just waiting for... He's just waiting for somebody to ask him. There's one other place. Um, right down here, the island of Cochang. Okay, Elephant Island. It's a beautiful island. My family, we've been there several times on vacation. I can only handle vacation for about 24 hours, but <laughs> beautiful beaches, um, no Adventists at all. So, if anybody would like to be a missionary at a beautiful beach. But we are, we've got to organize a prayer thing. Again, this is up to God. We're, we've got to come to Him, and, and He's got to do it. It's like, with, if we continue going the way we've been going, we will be here 600 years from now. And I'm not willing for the, to do that. I mean, I won't be here. God, we've got to do something different. And I don't have... Any other, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't have any other solution than we've got to put God back in charge. It's his work. And we can't stop. We've got to stop dragging our heels. Say, Lord, whatever you want. Because what he wants is good. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for them. It's a win-win. He's that good. He can design it so that we're blessed. And, and I know this because every single missionary that has been doing this, and we've been doing this for 15 years now, we've got a bunch of every single missionary that's out there will tell you, I wish I'd done this sooner. And they start out 
wondering if God's going to work for them. And they come back saying, this is how God worked for me. So there's blessing in, for the goer and there's blessing for the receiver. But we've got to put God back in charge of our lives. And we're afraid that if, he, if we put God, I, for me, this is my whole life experience. I'm afraid of putting God in charge because he might not be good. I was so foolish. I was so blinded. God is so good. He's better than we think. So we should change the way we think. Let's put God back in charge and say, God, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. And then see what he does. Praise God. Thank you. We will close. We're going to have a little bit of prayer. And I would like to call and ask and request humbly if he would pray for Kantara Lak this evening. And we'll begin this. I know that we feel, I feel, I don't know if you guys feel the same way. It's like here we are, you know, 10,000 miles away from this little city that we've never been to. We don't know who the people are there. We don't feel any burden for them. And our little prayers, our little dinky words that come out of our mouth, what good are they? But God takes those words and he hears them and he takes them and he says, yes, now I can go do something. And he begins to move. I usually put more faith in my, what I can accomplish with my hands, what I can do. But as that saying says, when man works, man works. And when man prays, God works. And he can, he can accomplish more in 20 minutes or in a minute, in a half a minute, than I can accomplish in a lifetime. So don't give up on your prayers. See who you are in God's kingdom. If he gave his son for you, definitely he's gonna to listen to what you have to say. Especially as we pray for him, his Holy Spirit to pray through us. If we're praying for people we don't know, Jesus knows them, he's connected with them right now. He feels their pain, he feels their hunger, and if we're connected with Jesus, then that burden can come on us, and we can start praying under that burden. If the Holy Spirit is praying through us, you think God's gonna answer that prayer? It's God praying his own will through us. It's a done deal. So brother, if you could lead us in prayer for Kantaralak. Okay. So good evening, everyone. As we spend this just two minutes tonight, two minutes, first minute, let's start praising God for who he is. Amen? Amen. Remember, he is a faithful God. How he provided for for George Mueller, he's been providing for Tim Maddox, for Jesus for Asia, and for many other things. So tonight he deserves our praises. So as we gather together, let's, let's group ourselves by twos or by threes. In the first minute, let's, let's spend that praising God. And the second minute, let us spend that asking for the Holy Spirit to move into our hearts and to move to those places that Brother John just, just mentioned. So if you could join us, if you're comfortable kneeling down on your knees. Yes, what was the name, uh, the name of, the, of the places again? Kantaralak? Kantaralak? You're doing pretty good with that. Okay. Somebody else is shaking their heads. Like, Kantaralak? Sukhothai? Uh, no, not Sukhothai. Uh, Kantaralak, Kochang. Mm -hmm. Kochang, and uh, hold on, uh, that other one I haven't. Ban Kun Tian. Just Kun Tian. Kun, Kung Tan. Kung Tan. We'll go with that. <laughs> so let's sing the chorus of this song. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, 
Lord, unto me. Dear Father, before we could ask anything from you, we just want to praise your name. So friends, in this first minute, let us just praise God for he deserves it. We may start praying with the people with us. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. Yes, dear Father, that is our first prayer request tonight. Before we could even intercede for those places that we could not even pronounce, dear Lord, we ask that may we ask for the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts tonight. So may this next minute of our intercession, or a minute and a half, let us pray that our hearts would be ready to receive the outpouring of His Spirit. That this faith camp would be bathed with His Spirit. Friends, as we have heard from Brother John, not by might nor by power, but only by His Spirit. By your Spirit, O Lord, in Zechariah 4, 6. So friends, let us, let us pray for this outpouring. Let us pray that our hearts will be filled with His Spirit. We may begin our time of prayer. Thank you. 
God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, is so good to me. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. He's so good to me. Father God, as we close out this evening, Father, we're just, our hearts are breaking for people we've never met. We love our kids. We love our children that we have brought into this world. We love our family because we know them. Father, you know those people in Kantarak and Buntan and Kochang like we know our kids. And you love them more than we love our kids. And so, Father, we ask that you will place this burden for these people on our hearts. Father, we may not be able to go there, but we can pray. And Father, with, that, with those prayers, you can work and you can do miracles and we can see a harvest for heaven. Father, there's not much time left to grow the population of heaven before us. Once we get to heaven, Father, that's it. That's it. The door is closed. Right now, Father, the door is open. So please hold it open a little bit longer that we can do this work so that people can see you. We, we, we ask that you will that you'll bind Satan from blinding their eyes. And Father, also bind him from blinding our eyes to the value of a soul. Father, we just surrender everything to you. We need your Holy Spirit. Yes. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, the love that he felt was immeasurable. And your mission to us is to put that love in our hearts. Father, we ask for it. Mm. Father, we thank you that we can partner with you and be with us tonight as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just want to remind everyone that the best part of faith camp happens at 5.50 in the morning, and that is United Prayer, and um, you don't want to miss it. God is, always blesses us, and um, we enjoy the opportunity to meet together with Him together in the morning. Also wanted to let those of you with young children or friends with young children that are coming know that um, there will be a children's program at the 9.30 and the 2.30 meeting times. And um, so that will be during those two times. So that will be downstairs, I believe, in the, in the, um, I can't even think of the word. It's the opposite, yeah, it's the community services side. It's not the dining room side. So anyway, thank you and everyone sleep well. Rest well. Please be considerate of your neighbors that want to go to sleep right away. And um, if you haven't registered, please stop by.